This lesson deals with the inverse Laplace transform with complex poles and some properties of residues. You can find these notes in the ECE 202 ebook in chapter 9 starting on page 20. As we'd shown at the bottom of page 16, if f of s has a complex pole at p equals minus alpha plus j beta, then it must also have a pole at the conjugate, in other words minus alpha minus j beta. Otherwise, the coefficients of the denominator will not be real. And this will be one of the conditions that we need when we apply the Laplace transform to circuit elements, real coefficients. So our partial fraction expansion will have two terms, one with s plus alpha minus j beta and one with s plus alpha plus j beta. Call k the residue for the first term. The second term will have the same residue but the conjugate. Now why would that be true? Well, when you find k, we're going to be multiplying our function f of s by s plus alpha minus j beta and then letting s equal minus alpha plus j beta. Now when you find the second residue, you're going to be multiplying by this term in the denominator, s plus alpha plus j beta, and then evaluating at s equals minus alpha minus j beta. But that's the same expression as this with j replaced by minus j. And that's our definition of the conjugate. So the second residue would be the conjugate of the first. So if we find the residue, it has a magnitude and angle. The conjugate would have the same magnitude, but, but the negative of the angle. So our f of t would have our term k times e to the j theta, and then we would have the inverse Laplace transform of this denominator term, which is e to the minus alpha plus j beta times t. And then for the conjugate, the same terms, but j replaced by minus j. Now let's combine this into one term. Let's pull out e to the minus alpha t from both terms, that's right over here, and the magnitude of k. I'm going to multiply 2 and divide by 2. Now what's left over is e to the j theta times e to the j beta t. I'll put those two together, and I get e to the j beta t plus theta. Likewise, for over here, I'll bring the e to the j theta over here, and I get a minus the quantity j beta t plus theta. Now what is this? Well, from trig, that's the identity for the cosine of x. So our f of t then would be twice the magnitude of our residue times e to the minus alpha t times the cosine of beta t plus theta. And this is how we would find k and theta in evaluating the residue. Let's do an example. Suppose that f of s is equal to 20 times s plus 3 divided by s plus 1 and then divided by s squared plus 2s plus 5. Now can you find the roots of this second order equation? I wrote down a general form from algebra that if we had an equation ax squared plus bx plus c that the roots are minus b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4 times a times c divided by 2a. Now in our case here, a is 1, b is 2, and c is 5. So again, the roots would be s is equal to minus 2 plus or minus 2 squared minus 4 times 1 times 5 divided by 2 times 1. Inside here, I'm going to get minus 20 plus 4, so that's minus 16. And the square root of minus 1 is j, and then the square root of 16 is 4, and then we're going to divide that by 2 and get 2. And then we have minus 2 divided by 2, which is minus 1. So f of s is equal to k1 divided by s plus 1 plus k2 divided by s plus 1 minus j2, and then divided by s plus 1 plus j2, where the residue here is the conjugate of this one. Let's find k1. Multiply f of s by s plus 1, and then let s equal minus 1. This term cancels with this, and I have 20 times minus 1 plus 3, minus 1 squared, which is 1, minus 2s plus 5. This is equal to 2 times 20, which is 40. Here I've got 6 minus 2, which is 4, and that ratio is equal to 10. To find k2, we'll multiply f of s by this denominator, s plus 1 minus j2, and then evaluate it at the root, which is minus 1 plus j2. Again, this term will cancel with this one. And then we're going to have 20 times minus 1 plus j2 plus 3. I'm putting in the value of s here. Likewise, minus 1 plus j2 plus 1. And then I've got minus 1 plus j2 plus 1 plus j2. And let's evaluate that. So here i got 3 minus 1, which is 2. So i got 2 plus j2. Here the 1s cancel each other. And I guess you get j2. Here the 1s cancel again and I just have j2 twice, or j4. Divide the 2's into here, and divide the 4 into here as a 5, and then j squared is minus 1, so I get a minus 5 minus j5. Put that into polar form, so punching that in my calculator, get a magnitude of 7.07 .07 and an angle of minus 135 degrees. That's actually the 5 times the square root of 2, and what I've got here is an angle of 45 degrees, but I'm in the third quadrant. So now I can find my inverse Laplace transform, f of t, using our table. k1 was equal to 10, 
So I'll have 10, and then the inverse Laplace transform of one over s plus one, alpha is equal to one, we're gonna get e to the minus one times t. Now for our inverse Laplace transform for this term, we had a cosine function, where this was beta, this was theta, and then we have alpha multiplying t here. In our case, alpha is equal to one, so we get e to the minus one t. The coefficient in front from the last page was twice the magnitude of k, so that's 14.14. The angle theta is just the same here, minus 135 degrees, and the value of beta is equal to two. That's this term right over here. We'll multiply that by u of t. Now let me show you that the residue for third term is the complex conjugate of the second term. So let's find the residue by multiplying by s plus one plus j2, and then evaluating when s is equal to minus one minus j2. This term will cancel with one of these terms. We're gonna plug in for s, minus one minus j2, minus one minus j2, and minus one minus j2. Here I get three minus one, which is two, so I get two minus j2. The ones here again cancel, and I just get a minus j2. The ones here cancel, and I get a minus j4. Cancel the twos into here. Cancel the four into here is five. And then I get a j squared, which is a minus one, and the minus signs cancel. And so I get a, a minus sign multiplying this, so I get a minus five, but then I have a minus sign here, so I get a plus j5. Our, our value for k2 was minus five minus j5, and that's the conjugate of the term we have here. And so k3, which we just found, is the conjugate of k2. Next, I'd like to state the property of the sum of residues. k1 plus k2 through k sub n is equal to zero if n is greater than m plus one, and it's equal to k if n is equal to m plus one. Now why would that be true? Let's take our function f of s, let's multiply by s, and then let's let s approach infinity. As s gets larger, then we have the leading terms dominating. So in the denominator, that's s to the n, and in the numerator, it's s to the m, but we're gonna multiply by an additional s here, so we get s to the m plus one, and we also have k in front. Now if we expand this in terms of our partial fraction expansion, we have, we have k1 times s over s minus p1, k2 times s over s minus p2, all the way through k sub n times s divided by s minus p sub n. Now I take the limit as s approaches infinity for this, we get k1s over s, k2s over s, and then k sub n s over s, and the s is canceled. We get k1 through k sub n. Now suppose that n is equal to m plus one. In this left-hand side of the equation, we have k times the limit as s approaches infinity of s to the m plus one, but that's the same as n. So these cancel, and we just get k in front. And then of course that has to equal the right hand side of the equation. Now if n were greater than m, then again we have s to the m plus one divided by s to the n, but now the denominator is greater than the numerator. As s approaches infinity, this gets smaller and smaller, so it approaches zero. And so the sum of the residues has to equal zero in this case. Let's do an example. Suppose we want to find the residues for the expression f of s equal to 21 times s plus five over s plus three divided by s plus 10. So that's some k1 divided by s plus three and k2 divided by s plus 10. So let's find k1, multiplier f of s by s plus three, and then let s equals minus three. So again, this is gonna cancel with this, and we have 21 times minus three plus five over minus three plus 10. So it's 21 times two divided by seven, and that turns out to be six. Now n is equal to two in this case. Again, s squared in the denominator. m is equal to one, that's the highest power of s in the numerator. So n is equal to m plus one. So from our property above, then k has to equal k1 plus k2. But k here was 21. Now we know that k1 was equal to six, so then we can solve for k2 would be equal to 15. Maybe as an exercise, you could find the residue k2 by doing this multiplication and evaluating when s is equal to minus 10. These are some properties of the inverse Laplace transform for complex poles and some properties of residues.